We just arrived at Leicester Station, and when you come out, you walk past a statue of Thomas Cook, and I was wondering why. So I looked him up, and I found out that in the 1800s, he chartered a train to take 500 passengers from Leicester to Loughborough and back again for a shilling, which was apparently the first train excursion, which means that Leicester is known as the birthplace of popular tourism. It's also where Richard III was buried under a municipal car park till they dug him up and put him in the cathedral. But these facts are as nothing to the things we're going to find out from our guest, who grew up in this city. Grace Petrie once went on stage at the Cambridge Folk Festival and introduced herself as a socialist, feminist, lesbian protest singer to roars of applause. And her songs do deal with some of the issues of contemporary society, but they can also be very tender, very heartfelt and reveal her emotions. And we're so looking forward on this crisp, cold, sunny January day to walking with her in her home city. Grace. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> lovely to see you. We're outside your house now, I think, aren't we? We are, yeah. Just yeah. about, yeah. And yeah. it's a lovely day. Miraculously it is, But you're yeah. wearing a hat and was... gloves and a scarf. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm doing up all my layers. Because it's um, going to be cold, uh, yeah, but sunny. I'm... Well, that's, that's the hope. It was a most inauspicious start this morning. The fog was so thick that I couldn't see to the end of the road, so I think we've done well, really. Well, let's set off yeah. walking. Okay. Where are we going to go? So I thought we'd go down the um, canal towpath the Grand Union Canal that runs through Leicester. We're in the west end of Leicester. Um, this is actually over the other side of the city from where I grew up. I grew up over by the Leicester University, which is where my parents both went. But we're in the west end, which is the more sort of, well, <laughs> colourful, colourful end of colourful town. End. Okay. Yeah, yeah, cheaper right. property over this way, put it that way. And what yeah. about the canal? I mean, are we going to find a very picturesque spot? Uh, I mean, it's a sort of, Proper working, dirty canal. Excellent. Um, so we might find some uh, disused shopping trolleys, that kind of thing. We'll probably find some disused shopping trolleys. You may well see some narrowboats. People on boats coming up and down the canal. And, and is it a walk that you do often? Yes. You're going to get a complicated story of dog custody now. I've sort of been sharing the custody of a Jack Russell with my sister for about Frank. five years. This is Frank, yeah. Frank, who became quite famous on social media. He became very famous on social media, and as such, I've had to give him back to my sister because my ego couldn't take how much. People always wanted to see Frank more than they wanted to see me. What a lot of people don't know about Frank is that I was sort of only temporarily looking after him. And then the pandemic hit, and I couldn't go anywhere. Obviously, I couldn't tour anywhere, so he just sort of stayed with me for a couple of years. And now, fingers crossed... I'm kind of starting up touring again as frequently as I was. And he's an old chap, Frank. He's about 13 years old, so he's sort of in his winter years, and so he's kind of retired back to my sister's house now, so I'm afraid he's not with us today. Well, you've but been, are you missing him? I am missing him. My sister lives in Leicester, so I'm glad that I get to see him quite a lot. But this is the walk that I, I have done many hundreds of times in the company of Frank. Well, I'm yeah. glad to be following in the footsteps of Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you'd be better behaved than Frank ever was. <laughs> so, so, Grace, tell us about growing up in, in Leicester. What sort of a childhood did you have here? A very happy one. Uh, I mean, so I'm the youngest of four children, which is how you end up with a spoilt narcissist performer as a kid, I think. What, so you're sort of waving your arms about in the background, yeah. saying, hello, take pay attention to me. Yeah, basically. Well, <laughs> also, I'm um, obviously still am very small. I was incredibly small as a kid. My siblings are all normal sized, so I was sort of working doubly hard to like get all the attention from these three gigantic creatures as I saw them. Yeah, but I went to school in Leicester. My mum and dad, they're both retired now. My mum was a social worker. She was the manager of a children's home and my dad was a probation officer. So quite so, sort of So liberal. the idea of public service was, was very strong in your yes. childhood, presumably? 
people have asked me before whether or not I sort of get my politics from my parents, and I think the answer is definitely yes. But I would say that we weren't sort of explicitly indoctrinated as children, you know what I mean? I think the ideals that my folks brought us up with are things I would now, I suppose, recognise as socialism, but it was just more sort of, you know, treat people decently and no one left behind and, you know, never treat anybody differently because of race or religion or sexuality or gender. I mean, these are things that I sort of think of them as just fairly... Sort of basic, of that's automatic the price values, of entry, isn't but, it? Uh, yeah. yeah, would that they were. I mean, particularly in this country at the moment, it's starting to feel like a very radical position, I think. <laughs> and the city of Leicester, which I don't know very well, I know about Richard III being dug up under the car park. Yes, thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, <laughs> we're very proud of that. I know There's scarcely about... a road left in Leicester we haven't changed the name of to Richard III Road. <laughs> yeah. I know about Thomas Cook starting popular tourism course, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But what should I know about Leicester, really, You know, if I wasn't just reading the tourist brochure? Well, what should you know about Leicester? The longest uninterrupted terrace street in Europe, Tudor Road. Uh, the largest outdoor covered market in Europe. Walker's Crisps. <laughs> the biggest celebration of Diwali outside uh, India, I true, understand. That's true, yeah. The biggest Caribbean carnival in the country outside Notting Hill. And what did you do when you were a, a teenager in Leicester? Were you already involved in music at that stage? What, when did you take up music? I was in a succession of quite terrible bands uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> when come on, I was tell, a teenager. You've got to tell us the names of them. Yeah, um, one was called... Uh, Amazing Grace and the Lost Boys. Oh, good. I know. Thank God they remained lost. <laughs> and another one was called Blackjack. <laughs> <laughs> I say we were terrible bands. I was in a succession of bands with boys from my school who basically had learned how to play the guitar in an effort to try and get girlfriends which was precisely the reason that I had he also learned to the play the guitar. Uh, and none of us were successful at all in that endeavour. And were you always the front person? I was, yeah. It's funny. They were quite sort of adamant that I shouldn't play the guitar and I should just sing in this kind of Debbie Harry sort of way. And I Stevie always, Nicks. Yeah, and I always kind of saw myself as much more of a guitar holder. You know, it's funny that these kind of sexist ideals of what a woman's place in a band is they still do persist I think about and where would you play gigs what, what sort of gigs would you play I mean they weren't even really gigs I wouldn't say I mean most of the time we were just doing did a couple of school concerts and stuff but it was mostly just uh, getting together in bedrooms and playing covers and things I'm talking about when I was about 14, 15 yeah. and then I got my sort of foothold in the Leicester gig scene when I used to do the open mic night at the Musician, which is a sort of legendary Leicester venue. I don't know if you're familiar with it. No, I don't know it. Yeah, it's still that. going strong. It's unbelievably <laughs> we've survived the pandemic. It's quite off the beaten path of the city. And they used to do this open mic night on a Monday night, which was a little bit legendary, called the City Acoustic Club. And I think I started playing down there when I was about 18 on a Monday night. Was that with That's... songs that you'd written yourself? Yeah, yeah, if you could call them songs. <laughs> <laughs> what, because they were early attempts, you're a bit embarrassed early about attempts. now, are you? Yeah, I think in the old days you'd record a CD and then I suppose once you're embarrassed you'd stop selling it and it'd sort of quietly fade away and that doesn't really happen these days. You write something, you put it on the internet and it's indelible, isn't it? But yeah, I mean, I sort of try and be philosophical about it. I think it's kind of nice to have a record of where you've come from it's you know yeah. if you can look back and think I was a worse songwriter 15 years ago than I am today that's probably preferable to the alternative isn't it really quite, you're, getting you're, at least you're going uphill yeah. yes so were you writing about political issues then about gender issues that kind of thing or were you writing love songs or or a bit of both yeah well I would say that um to my mind I wouldn't really regarding anything I was writing as political but I was emulating basically, you know, pop songs that I heard on the radio and I was writing love songs and I'm gay and I kind of always knew I was gay from a pretty young age. So the love songs that I was writing were, you know, about girls. And I was quite old before I came to think of that as in any way a political act. I mean, I'm very, very, very lucky with my family, with my parents in particular, as I said so it wasn't um, an issue to them that you were gay? Not remotely, not remotely. Yeah. And, I, and I think 
it was such a non-issue. It sheltered me actually a lot. You know, I think I thought homophobia wasn't even really an issue until I was an adult, really, because I never had a moment's pause about telling my parents about coming out to my parents. I just knew that would be fine. So we've come down by the canal. Yes. Uh, so this is right the canal. Here. And we've got some Canada geese. Yes. Six or seven of them there, and some ducks. Yeah. My partner is a bird enthusiast. And I am learning the birds a a little bit as I go along. So I think you get some more hens down here. Coots. Some coots, I think. Is it cormorant? Is that another? Yeah, you get some cormorants down here. Yeah. Um, Herons? I've never seen a heron down here. But yeah, the Canada geese are a big fixture. And a lot of the swans, you get some of the teenage swans that are still sort of dirty grey. And I am afraid to tell you that we are more likely than not to see one or two rats down oh, the canal yes, today course. so i hope you're prepared for uh, but it, leicester's it, finest it is actually quite a beautiful sight isn't it because of the oh, other cyclists coming through because the the sun is very bright today and quite yeah. low mm. and so it's shining and reflecting off the surface of the water mm. here, which is rather attractive there's a narrow boat there is a narrow boat uh, yeah. yeah i told Lord you we up. might see we might see a couple yeah yeah. Did you? Uh, what about? How do we feel do about song here? here? Yeah, well, that would be great. Yeah. This, this There's a really nice bench. There's with a, a really nice bench covered in graffiti yeah, and an old cornflakes packet. An old cornflakes packet, and I think is that a gin and tonic? Yeah, a gin and tonic and, uh, and a fag. So yeah. <laughs> you've got, what a great We've got backdrop. everything, haven't yeah. we? We've got everything. We and, could and possibly gonna, need. Are you going to sing a song from your your early days? Are you going to sing a song well, about? Well, that your... feels appropriate. Yeah. I think. Yeah. What is it? Well, it's called. Um... <laughs> I'm just thinking about the. Um, the surroundings. The location to sing it in couldn't be better. It's called This Time Next Year We'll Be Millionaires. Um, <laughs> and which... Is this kind of what you were thinking about, like, my dreams of stardom? Yes, I when think When you were setting so. out as a yeah, musician. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, I was so I was working in, for years in Leicester, I worked in a bar. I worked in a bar called Firebug, which we would actually hit if we carried on walking in that direction for about 15 minutes. And it is a late licence bar between the ages of 18 and 22 I spent a lot of time clocking in for a shift at 10 p.m and pulling pints until 4 a.m and then cleaning the bar down for an hour afterwards and finishing work at 5 a.m and uh, I don't mind telling you I'm still on very good terms with the proprietors of that bar but I don't mind telling you that it was a minimum wage bar job you know doing the graveyard shift and I was kind of seeing gigs as the road out of that life <laughs> <laughs> and um, you're looking at, at, at pop stars and thinking I could do with a bit of that action basically yeah yeah that was the thinking <laughs> behind it so and as yeah. we stand here now on the canal towpath some years later how would it feel to sing this <laughs> I mean I think my my little 18 year old bartending self honestly wouldn't believe that I ever got to a stage of having music as a profession that's all I ever was hoping for really and definitely at that age it felt like a million miles away so this is a heck of an audience by those uh, (laughs) by those standards every day the goalposts move every day something new to prove I'm not Lily Allen, I'm not Kate Nash Billy Bragg or Johnny Cash, but I'm true And this one's for you So stick with me, honey I'll see you right One day we'll have so much money We'll drink champagne every night I'm not Katie Tunstall, I'm not Katie Lang This ain't the best song anyone's ever sang But it's true And honey, it's for you And this one's for you, this one's for you For every show you've ever been to And when we're having a ball I promise it'll be worth it all And all those nights I'm pulling pints Trying to justify this crazy life Well one day, not too far away We'll look back and say It worked out okay anyway And this 
this time next year We'll be millionaires Won't still be sitting here Playing to empty chairs And heating okay And all those magazines be saying They love your hairstyle But they hate my jeans If they do At least I'll be true And this one's for you This one's for you For every show you've ever been to And when we're having a ball I promise it'll be worth it all And all those nights I'm pulling pints Trying to justify this crazy life Well one day, not too far away We look back and say It worked out okay Yeah one day, not too far away We look back and say It worked out okay anyway that was fantastic, complete with ducks quacking. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That was absolutely yeah. brilliant, thank you. <laughs> it's yeah, it's very it's, funny to be seeing it on this bench. <laughs> <laughs> and and to, to be singing it, you know, it is interesting about the way when you've written a song at a particular point in your life and then you come back to it years later, does it take on a different feeling to you? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I mean it sort of sounds tweet now that song you know what I mean because it sounds sort of like oh well you know it's quite optimistic isn't it it's very optimistic but I think that my partner's a writer and we talk a lot about the sort of mythologising of the arts and the mythologising of the touring life and how unhealthy that actually is because I think it's bad for everybody's mental health it's bad for the people who are kind of feeling like they're missing out on this amazing star-studded life and it's bad for the people who are sort of living this life which more often than not is much more about checking into a travel lodge at 2am on your own on the motorway services and sort of feeling very alienated from the rest of the people in your life it's such a naive take on everything isn't it that little kind of 18 year old me writing this song thinking oh you know one day if I ever make it and I get to be a musician I'll just be the happiest person in the world and I'll you know drink champagne every night and so it is it's funny to sort of look back on it as a a grizzled and grey haired 34 year old (laughs) So when you were writing love songs about girls, did you worry about the audience? No, I think, as I say, my parents just really instilled in me this sort of lack of anxiety about it, really, you know, and it wasn't until I was in my sort of early 20s and I was seeing gigs quite regularly when somebody, I think, first said to me, it's so brave the way you just sort of sing about being gay like that. And it just hadn't occurred to me at all that it could ever be interpreted as such you know because as I say I was so strongly brought up to feel like there was no bravery involved in being who I am and that there never should need to be so I wasn't ever worried about it and I think it's funny because I've obviously gone on in my later sort of phases of songwriting to become a bit of a protest singer and write about politics in much more of an explicit and sort of deliberate way I think representation and visibility is a very important political act. Rightly or wrongly, I do feel some sort of sense of responsibility to sort of be as visible as I, as I can be, because I think, you know, when I was a kid, I know that it would have been very useful to me to sort of see more queer kind of icons in music and definitely in terms of being a butch woman and seeing so few butch women in the media, you know, I think that's something that I now do regard as, like, quite political with a capital P. And some of your songs must have been received by other lesbian and gay people as being a statement that they were really proud to see. Yeah, I think so. I've had a lot of communications to that effect, particularly since I brought out the album Queer as Folk in 2018. There's a song in it called Black Tie, which is a sort of letter of kind of self-acceptance and a letter to my sort of teenage self saying there's nothing wrong with the way that you are and being butch is fine and being gay is fine and I've had a lot of lesbian teenagers get in touch with me about that which is an immensely rewarding thing to And when you're playing it and people are bashing out the chorus with you, that yeah, must be a great feeling It's amazing, it really is amazing Yeah, it's, it's, I mean I've played it maybe more than any other song actually and I still some songs you've played them a million times and obviously you can't help going a little bit autopilot throughout them and that one I never 
it never doesn't make me feel a bit choked up, you know. So, yeah. what about politics? So, you've talked about what about it? Eh? No, 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 but you but you've talked <laughs> who'd, about who'd, who'd you know about politics? making statements about sexuality and so on. Mm. But more generally, your socialist views. Mm. How did they develop and? What do you think was the root of their development? Yeah, well, I mean, so I am 34 and a half. We're just going under a bridge, which is why it's gone all echoey. Yes, I'm 34, and then the long shadow of echo. (laughs) um, Whoa, 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 34. (laughs) Aging through the reverberations of time. Um, Yeah, so I was in my very early 20s in the 2010 general election, which obviously lumbered us with a coalition government between the Lib Dems and the Conservatives. And, you know, I was working at the time, I was living in Sheffield, working at the Students' Union Bar, when it's sort of impossible to imagine now, <laughs> but the country was swept up by something called Clegmania. Do you oh, remember yeah. this? What, you mean yeah. the scene in the Rose Garden? Oh, yeah. Before the parties in the garden, yeah, there was yeah. Nick Clegg and there David Nick Cameron. Nick Clegg and David Cameron in the Rose Garden, having yeah. Having a bromance. But before the election, I mean, there was, oh, there was yes. this sort of... I agree with Nick. Uh, I agree with Nick. This cause celeb for a while was Nick Clegg's Liberal Democrats, who at the time were famously pledging to repeal tuition fees if they were elected. And he was and a Sheffield MP as well. He was a Sheffield Hallam MP, yeah. And he made that pledge about tuition fees on the steps of... Sheffield City Hall to a crowd of an enormous amount of Sheffield University students and he picked up an awful lot of students votes you know a lot of people did attribute those votes to that pledge and of course anyone who (laughs) was older and wiser in sort of new British politics better than me and my sort of student comrades did was totally unsurprised that what in fact happened was that not only did they not repeal tuition fees but Nick Clegg was part of a government which in fact tripled them to £9,000 a year. And, you know, I was very young and I was very naive and I was very green. But I remember very clearly this sense that this system is meaningless if they can just lie. <laughs> you know, if they can just lie before the election, if they can just say anything to make you vote for them and then there's absolutely no mechanism to hold anyone to account for those promises then surely the idea of this democracy is absolute nonsense. And I remember talking to a lot of student friends about it, and I remember talking to a lot of my parents' friends and my parents and older generations about it, and this sense that was very pervasive was, well, yeah, he, you know, he may be lied about that, but it was really your fault for believing him. And I remember it being such a light bulb moment for me. So that was, I suppose, my entry into writing about politics I wrote a song called the Emily Davison Blues and my friend Tim and I who I was living with at the time in Sheffield we went and uh, sat outside Nick Clegg's constituency office in Sheffield Hallam and I sang the song outside the door and we made a video for it and put it online and uploaded it to YouTube and I think by the next morning it had been viewed a couple of thousand times or something which was you know I didn't have any profile or audience or anything at that time so that was quite an impact and in the early days of the coalition government it was an incredibly politically fertile time you know that generation of student activists in the wake of the tuition fee broken promise there was all manner of massive response to that you know huge demonstrations there was an NUS demo in 2011 where 50,000 students marched on London it was overwhelmingly well organized and peaceful and this was around about the same time that Occupy Wall Street was happening and Occupy St Paul's was happening and, you know, it just really felt like... Change is going to happen. Yeah, and, and my generation is going to be the generation that changes the world, right. you know. And then I sort of found out that my generation wasn't the first generation to think that. <laughs> <laughs> well, just think, I was thinking about the role of music in yes. all of this, because, you know, obviously there's a, a, a long and proud history of protest song. Yeah. Were you listening to other people from the past who'd written political or protest music? Were you ever influenced by... Dylan or uh, people like that? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I would say, have to say not really, actually. I mean, I loved Bob Dylan, but I, I kind of loved the love songs and the poetry a little bit more than the more famous protest songs. But I think it's something that I did sort of get into, you know, in reverse. I mean, it's... You uh, got into it because you had something to protest about. Yeah. And you needed to say it. I mean, the, you know, I didn't know what a protest singer was. Somebody said to me, oh, you're a protest singer. And that wasn't a term that I'd ever heard before. And then in my sort of 
late 20s when I kind of got more into the folk scene and I was writing more folk inspired music and I met people like Leon Rosserson and Roy Bailey and Peggy Seeger and you know I was invited to be a part of something called the Anti-Capitalist Roadshow which was a sort of collective of 10 or 11 artists Sandra an amazing thing to it was to be going yeah. on the road I mean we've had Peggy Seeger on this yeah podcast I mean and I was pretty awe inspired you know sitting talking to her in her living yeah. room it must have been amazing to go and perform with those greats oh of, yeah of yeah and, and you know songs. Sandra Kerr and Frankie Armstrong and Rob Jones I mean it was all you know it's like every one of them on stage was like a absolute heavyweight titan of folk music and then there was me like the work experience kid on the end you know and how did they treat you I mean gorgeously yeah I love them all I loved Roy very much yeah, the wonderful Roy Bailey, who, um, I don't know, my, my uh, grandfather's both died before I was born, and I had this relationship with him where I just sort of felt like he was the sort of naughty grandpa that I never had, you know. I mean, they all were just absolutely lovely to me, and I learned just a phenomenal amount. Well, from... I was going to ask you about that. What sort of things did you feel you picked up from associating with people with that level of experience, not just in music, but also in campaigning? Yeah, I mean, I think... The songwriting, Leon in particular, Leon Rosterson, I think the ability that he has to distill a political issue to something that goes right to the heart of you, I think that's something that, you know, nobody likes to be shouted at, I suppose. And I think Leon has this incredible way of taking something that you might have read in the papers that you might have almost become desensitised to, and he has this beautiful way of connecting it to the sort of real life and heart and soul of human beings around you, you know, better than any songwriter I know. And, you know, Roy, I mean, all, honestly, all of them, I could stand here and wax lyrical about absolutely every, every single one of them, but I learned a lot about showmanship, I suppose, from Roy. You know, I think he had a gorgeous way with an audience. He had this way of making everyone in the room feel personally invited, you know. It felt like he was just doing it for you and he was so thrilled you were there. And he had this way of making 5,000 people at a festival feel like the concert was just for them. And I think that's something that I've tried. I mean, I don't think I'd ever emulate the skill that he had in it, but it's something that I've really tried to work into my shows. You know, I think with humour and with just that sense of welcome, you know, that's the thing that I associate most strongly with him, really, was always feeling so welcome. I should say that we've just come alongside a lock we have. in the canal now. Yes. And I think this is Leicester City... Football this club. is Leicester City Football Club. The Foxes. Yeah. The Foxes. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, we're right opposite them, and there's a outbreak of gulls and orange boys going mm. across, and a weir. Yeah. You can hear the weir in the yeah. background. I think it looks to me like a place where a song I could think be sung. It could be sung, and yeah. a song maybe that references. <laughs> yeah, the I've Leicester got, City I've got Football just Club. The thing, Have you got one up your got sleeve? Just the thing. Yeah, <laughs> that would be wonderful. Yeah. Fox is school 
coop in the <laughs> right key in the middle there. <laughs> BV's there from the ducks. So that's, a, yes. that's so fantastic because I'm so depressed all the time when I hear <laughs> Americans singing songs that make their hometown sound really sexy and wonderful. <laughs> and it's about time somebody redressed the balance yes. when it came to Leicester. Leicester's owed one, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and what, what, what were you thinking when you wrote that song? Were, were well, you writing when you were away from Leicester? No, it's funny. I, was, I wrote this song just before the pandemic. I was on tour in Australia and I'd never been to Australia and I'd never been that far from home. I mean, I've lived in Leicester most of my life. I was born here. And I do have an enormous fondness for the city. I'm very proud of the city. And I was walking along here, and, you know, that line from the chorus, when the foxes score, I hear they're all from my front door, is absolutely true, and there's nothing like it on a gorgeous match day. I'm not actually a football supporter, but there's nothing like the sound of the jubilant triumph of Leicester fans, you know, the way that it kind of rolls across the city. I didn't really mean to write it. I kind of dashed it off pretty quickly, that song, but I was thinking about, you know... I've had this incredibly charmed, incredibly lucky life where I've been able to go overseas and have these amazing experiences and music takes me all over the world and hopefully, you know, fingers crossed, if I'm lucky, it'll keep taking me all over the world. But there's nothing like being home, you know. There's nothing like this is where my parents are, this is where my whole family is, this is where I was born and raised and these are my people, these are my foxes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's a wonderful feeling, isn't it? And, and to sing it's... Here, I mean, actually, they should invite you to sing it on the pitch. Have you ever? I mean, I'll pass that on. That? Yeah, I'll <laughs> yeah. ring them up and yeah, see if I can get them do. to do please that. Do, yeah. I think you should do, sing it before kickoff. Surely. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, on the record, I mean, it's it doesn't have the full effect here just with the acoustic, but on the record, I got uh, my friend Steve Pretty, who is an amazing brass player and horns player to put in these very like almost match of the day esque horns in the chorus there, so it feels very. Ba, 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 da, da, ba, 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 you know, so uh, so yeah, pass it on, pass okay. it, please do. We'll try and fix touch. that gig for yeah, you. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd and be great. what a great spot! I mean, yes. What, isn't it lovely here? You know, with the sun shining. Is it? Mm. I suppose it can be a bit miserable if it rains here, but there's a big expansion in the water suddenly yeah. because it goes into two branches. Yeah. And there's reeds growing along the edge in front of the stadium, mm. and the stadium is lit up in the yeah. sunlight. It's been rather great to walk down here. It really is. You know, you meet all sorts of different people. You meet presumably. all sorts of different people. <laughs> Yeah, and in the in the evenings, when there's an evening match, the stadium's all lit up in blue, and it's really amazing. You know, it's really gorgeous to watch the, the way that it's all lit up from across the canal. It's one of my favourite kind of views in the city, even though you you do meet some characters down here. <laughs> there's an old brick railway bridge. Mm here with the water reflecting onto the arch in a rather beautiful pattern and some less beautiful patterns of graffiti <laughs> all sprayed up the stanchions. Let's walk underneath yeah. it because I think it might sound some quite good. Some urban artefacts here I think. Yeah, yeah. And, and you can see where the water's drained down under the archway here as well yeah. and you can hear the echo yeah. of, of us coming through. 
And as you know, I've walked down here, like I said, most days, and it is ever-changing, the graffiti. Are you always going to be a, a city person, do you think? Do you think cities are the way you would Perhaps most... Perhaps not. Oh, Perhaps right. not. I don't think so. Well, I found in the pandemic myself quite sort of possessed by a desperate desire to be near the sea. It never bothered me about Leicester before, that it's obviously the most landlocked city in the country. But just being <laughs> kept in tours for two years... Was that when you made... filmed that video of you standing in the sea yes. singing? Yeah, so that's Where did at, you go to do that? That's at Haysborough in Norfolk. My partner lives in Norwich, and I'm moving to Norwich, actually, in the next little while. And we can rent for a little bit in Norwich, but the ultimate aim is to try and buy somewhere that's pretty much by the sea, on the sea. So, yeah, that's my hope, really. I find that it, it makes me just a lot saner, really, just being by the sea. I've... But not in it. I mean, just a bit, for those who haven't seen the video, mm. you actually sang the song yeah. up to your neck at yes. times. Well, with it's, a guitar. Funny. it's funny you that you mentioned that. Uh, into the sea. I took a guitar into the sea. The, I had... You would not believe the number of inquiries I had about the health of that guitar after that video. But I'm going to let you in on an a industry secret, a trade secret, is we chose that bit of the beach because it's normally immense waves and incredibly choppy waters. And, of course, the one day that you go there trying to film a song about stormy waters is the one day that it was, like, the most uh, serene like day. Like this canal. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It was the stillest day. So what I had to do is I'm actually... It looks like I'm standing up and I'm actually kneeling in the very, very shallow tide because it's the only way that we could get it to even seem like there was any waves. So what I'm doing is I'm sort of lapping in the pathetic shallow waters at Haysborough. But, but it, it looks like of... I survived a heck of a Way, right? well, I wonder if it was a sort of therapeutic thing after the lockdown that oh, you were yeah. able to go and do that and immerse yourself in it. Yeah. How was the guitar, by the way? Um, you know, because was it an expensive <laughs> guitar that you took and it got full of salt water? It was an inexpensive guitar, which the electrics in it had broken long before, and that's why it was the candidate for that video. But it was no worse than when it went in. Put it that way. A little bit saltier. That's about it. <laughs> Let's yeah. walk through here then. So we're going to. Th- plough through the mud yes to take a yeah. turn oh it's not as bad as it sometimes is down here and where are we going yeah. now through this this uh, alleyway uh, yeah, muddy so this alleyway is, this is going to bring us out onto the great central way which is just a, it's a path that sort of connects one side of the city to the other the song that i played before is actually called the great central way named after this walk so is, yeah is this associated with the railway because the railway is a big deal in in leicester isn't it yes i think it is i'm showing my ignorance now um, I think it's. I think it's something to do with it. <laughs> that's the. That's the answer to that question. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad we've got you as tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I was doing a pub walk around Leicester, I could give you a lot more information about the. What, what the history drink. of the different pubs? You've I worked mean, in most of them, presumably. I've worked in a few of them. Yeah. <laughs> if you're interested in where you can get served alcohol at any time of the day, <laughs> then I can tell you that. Well, that's quite that's important. A, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, there's some other yeah. great graffiti here on the wall. Mm. Beautiful colours. Yeah. Pinks and blues and oranges. Mm. Different people leaving their marks, obviously. Yeah. And it's quite secluded here, so presumably they don't get interrupted. I think that's it, yeah, I think that's it. It's I don't know if you way. noticed that there were some people preparing to fish in the canal there as well. Oh, really? You, you get some fishermen down there, yeah. And we're, we're turning away from the canal now, or are we just going to another branch of the canal? No, it? we're turning away from the canal. It's just a cycle path, basically. Right. It leads from one end of the city to the other, but it'll loop us back round to the where we got on the towpath, just near my gaff. Hello. Hiya. So I'm just going to ask you, Grace, is there a branch of Ikea in Leicester? <laughs> Why do you ask? Ah, <laughs> that's my method in my madness. Oh, ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a song about it anyway. But, I certainly but, do, yes. But is, is there an Ikea here? No. So right. my closest Ikea is in Nottingham. Right, but um, you go there presumably from time to time. Presumably I do, yeah. The, well, so the song that I think you're teaming up for, it's basically verbatim true, every word of it. I, I basically composed in Ikea. Which, well, composed in your head in Ikea. Yeah, 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 basically yeah. the words, anyway, yeah. And what um, inspired it? What was going on in your life at the time? Well, I was, I was at, it was after the end of a relationship and, uh, and I was, you know, kind of feeling a bit sore post-breakup and I have <laughs> cohabited with many partners and then had the relationship end and then it's kind of the worst thing about it is that you sort of feel like, well, I've got to kind of start again, you know, that you sort of build... I have to go back house. to Ikea and refurnish the house. Exactly, basically. And uh, 
And I was there on one of these kind of morose, freshly single trips to Ikea. And I realised that the only other people really in there, apart from people who were all doing exactly what I was doing, was, you know, blissfully happy new couples who were kind of filling their, filling their houses and choosing their furniture together. What a horrible and contrast. Obviously, <laughs> and, and it is a horrible contrast. And it also really made me think, like... All the singletons can't ever imagine being those guys in couples and all the guys in couples can't ever imagine being single, you know. So it just made me think that what a beautiful little juxtaposition of the human experience that you see in Ikea if you, if you, if you care to look around at it's it. It's such you know? a wonderful insight, I actually have to say. Now, ever since I heard the song, you know, every time I go to Ikea, which I have been to, <laughs> I'm like, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you see, you'll notice them people. now, won't you? Yeah. Yes. You'll notice them. Well, yeah. it'd be great if you'd sing it for us. I'd love to sing it for you, yeah. Yeah, let's just let these bikes pass us by. It's Wednesday evening in Ikea There's just two kinds of people here And in my life I've been both The new team's at the starting line Committing to each room design like it was a permanent oath. But that's not me. I know these aisles. And you can spot the ones like me for miles. There's no good natured arguments on taste. I have no need to compromise these days There's no one saying we've been here too long And I get exactly what I want It's Wednesday evening in Ikea And everywhere I look in here and you Seems trying to make themselves match But those couples sharing meatball tea Don't notice all the ghosts like me Back here alone and starting from scratch So spare a thought But for the grace Of ever disassembling shared space now there's no good natured arguments on taste. You know I have no need of compromise these days. There's no negotiations to concede. You know I get exactly what I need. What I need And see those optimistic lovers Picking duvet covers I wish them all the best From the bottom of my chest And if they follow the instructions There's no reason their constructions Really shouldn't last But then who am I to ask Because mine all fell apart And I'm right back at the start Hoping I've not lost Any fundamental parts And I'm sure that I'll remember how it all fits back together Cos I know I'm not inadequately skilled It's just that some things take Two people to build Wednesday evening in Ikea There's just two kinds of people here And in my life I have been both So poignant I, I love that And I love optimistic lovers picking duvet covers <laughs> <laughs> We've all been one haven't we We've all been one That's fantastic, thank you <laughs> Thank you <laughs> Do you think of what you do as folk music? Oh, it's the million dollar question isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, and it sort of bedevils us the whole time, you know. Yeah. So people ask us, well, what's folk on foot? How do you choose who you talk to? And yeah. But do you think of what you do as being part of a tradition of being in the spirit of some of those musicians and some of those songs that have gone before? Yeah, I do, actually. And I think, you know, I'm sort of slightly tongue-in-cheek at the saying about the million-dollar question because it is something that I have 
had thrown at me a little bit trying to kind of work on the folk scene in Britain because well, some people come and say well you're not folk music yeah basically me, you don't have an accordion yeah I don't, <laughs> and also you know I mean I think as you know we have this amazing standard of folk musician in Britain in terms of technical skill and I've been lucky to play with some of the most skilled you know players on the scene you know I was in coven with Lady Maisry and O'Healy and Tito who are all just phenomenal musicians and I've you know felt very inadequate you know there with my three chords basically that I just kind of strum on the guitar and just make a lot of noise and hope people are listening to me but I do think that you know there's room I think for both I think there's room for that incredible amazing level of skilled you know technical musicianship of which we have an incredible standard and I think there has to be room for what I would think of as the radical tradition of folk music traditionally it was the music of working people it was it was the conduit of working people to sort of speak truth to power and I think there's got to be room for that in the English folk tradition in 2022 in a country that is so ravaged by inequality you know where what is folk music doing if it's not pointing that out Mm. and and I wonder if you're a bit fed up as somebody who takes a left-wing point of view (laughs) about being marginalised if you like you know because you've got a conservative government that's been in power for many years Mm. do you ever give up and think well I'll just write some pretty love songs now and I I won't write about politics yeah I mean I think it I don't know if marginalised is the word I would choose but I think that certainly after the election result in 2019 I'd say that was probably my lowest political ebb (laughs) you know I campaigned for the Labour Party before that election and I did a month of benefit shows in marginal seats to try and raise money for the Labour Party. One wonders really how much worse we could have done if I hadn't bothered, to be honest, but I write what I mean. You know, I'm being honest when I write songs. And a lot of people sort of said, when this album came out in 2020, I think a lot of people were disappointed that there was what they might perceive as less sort of explicit political music on there. But it's tough, you know, you can't turn it on if it's not authentic, you know. And I think I do feel heartbroken, really, about the state of the country. I don't know what the answer is. None of my campaigning has worked. None of my songs have worked. None of my ideas have worked. My generation just keeps losing, you know. And But I get the sense you're not giving up. I mean, I'm just thinking about the song... <laughs> Uh, the, the losing side the losing on the side. album is a very yeah. interesting song because it, it it seems to start from the Sarah Everard yeah. protests, mm. uh, women protesting about not feeling safe on the streets, but then mm. it goes on to express a much wider point. Can you yes. talk about that? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, I was feeling overwhelmed and gutted and devastated, I suppose, in the wake of the... Sarah Everard Vigil and the Tories at the moment are pushing through this bill which will basically criminalise peaceful protest, even the peaceful protest of one person can be deemed to be a nuisance by the police and that will make that a a crime (laughs) and you know these are like fundamental human rights that we are literally having rolled back in this country at the moment and nothing that the left does or tries seems to be working so all of which is to say that I did reach a point of like enormous despair But I realised, you know, that as a woman and as a gay person, you know, I do have rights today that I only have because people came up before me and they fought for them. And in some cases they did die for them, you know. And I think just to go back to where we kind of started this chat, I got into politics when I was basically not much more than a kid. And I had this massively naive idea that there was going to be this massive revolution and, you know, maybe I would be able to be the musical the Pied Piper of the revolution maybe yeah yeah (laughs) or or at least the the narrator of it you know like making some sort of record of it that might be looked back upon one day and I think the truth is now I'm in my mid-30s I've sort of settled into an idea that politics is not a glorious thing (laughs) you know it's it's a lifelong struggle you know like Mark Thomas always says they don't call it the struggle for nothing and to realize these things that I believe in that I'm fighting for I may well not win in my lifetime I may not live to see these ideas triumph but that doesn't mean that you can give up because if all of those people felt like that 
if the suffragettes felt like that, if Harvey Milk felt like that, then I wouldn't really be where I am today, you know? And I think if the only, like, optimism that I can find is to feel like, well, maybe the only thing that I can do is add my weight to trying to tear down this wall while I'm alive and just know that if nothing else, I might be, like, one brick falling, then at least that's one brick fewer for the people coming after me, for the generations coming after me. And I think... We have to think like that, because otherwise, how would we keep going? From common grief to Bristol up in flames We came here begging justice, and instead we got the blame For peace disturbed out on the streets tonight Watching on the BBC, you know something's not right When mourners come with candles and with flowers Wrestled three on one and pinned down by the state's full powers. This is their world, and these have been the rules. And we have come to break it down with bloody fingernails for tools. This threat of violence, this tightrope wire. We can no longer bear it. We're all too fucking tired. No minute silence. We will sing higher. Don't tell us to light a candle when we have come to start a fire And if I spend my life on the losing side You can lay me down knowing that I try There's a better world than on a quiet day When I hold my breath I can hear her say she's on her She's on her way Safe for home You watch it on TV And never dream the one day You could be the enemy You might one day be under attack From all that should protect you Hoping someone has your back The history books are screaming from the shells The no government who outlaws speaking to defend ourselves Has good things planned A storm ahead I see And not one of us will bear it without solidarity Oh, I see trouble All my days Ailing, failing, well said signs of fire and flood and plague But from the rubble, from the waste The mightiest cathedral, from these ashes we will raise And if I spend my life on the losing side You can lay me down, knowing that I try There's a better world than on a cross Take your heart, my sister. This fire will never die. Take your heart, my comrades. And no one left behind. And if I spend my life on the losing side, you can lay. Knowing that I try, there's a better world And on a quiet day, when I hold my breath 
I can hear her say that she's on her way. Such a powerful rallying cry. Thank you very much indeed, Grace. And thanks for taking us around Leicester and uh, showing us the sights. Thank you. And singing the songs. I hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, it's been enjoyed amazing. enjoyed our ducks and our graffiti and, uh, <laughs> you know. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. The wonderful Grace Petrie in Leicester. And we have filmed all the songs that Grace performed for us in this episode. And we're going to add them to Folk on Foot on Film, which has more than 150 songs now that we've recorded on our travels around the UK. And you can get access to them if you become a patron of Folk on Foot. All you have to do to do that is go to folkonfoot.com and click on the Support Us button. We rely entirely on the support of our listeners to keep going. So if you can make a contribution, we'd be really, really grateful. (laughs) 